You are listening to the Julie Parker Practice Success Podcast, where you discover management insights and strategies for a successful dental practice. There are also interviews with key people in the industry who have advice and services to help you and your team achieve great success. Welcome to this episode of the Julie Parker Practice Success Podcast. And I've got a great guest and a topical guest with me today, Bobby Semple of Simplified Recruitment Solutions. And I'm thrilled to have Bobby with me today because the recruitment process for dental practices, for dental staff, has become more and more challenging as the previous months and years have gone by, even more so with the COVID impact. As well. And so I'm going to pick Bobby's brains and figure out what we can do to improve our processes for recruitment. And once we've actually got those new recruits within our practice, what we can do to help make the whole process much more successful for both sides. Welcome, Bobby. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me today, Julie. Uh, I'm really looking forward to talking about my experiences and seeing how I can help other businesses um, grow and find employees and how to keep good employees as well. Fantastic. Well, we need the advice. (laughs) I remember back in the day when I had my practice, for example, this was back in 2003, you'd put an advert out just in one location and you'd get a good 30 responses, good applicants coming through with experience and well-written resumes and great references. However, it has come to a point where we're advertising on Seek and Indeed and Facebook and we're getting a load of applicants that don't fit any of the criteria that we set out. So I think part of the process, there's a flaw in the process itself, but it's really challenging. We feel like in the dental space that the pool of people to choose from is getting ever smaller. You've actually had some experience in the dental space as well, Bobby. Tell us a little bit about your history. Yeah, so um, so back in the UK, um, my home country, I, I, I used to work for a dental company there. For about two two years, I did all the recruitment for them. I designed all their recruitment processes and systems and teams. And we recruited not only dentists, but practice managers and dental nurses throughout yeah. the UK and also Europe. So i um, got lots of experience dealing with the, in the healthcare industries. And um, more recently in Australia, I was uh, an owner of a, a dental company as well. Um, I grew that from two people to 70 people in about two years. So I really do get the, the need for employing great staff. And um, there's a few tips throughout the whole of this podcast that um, I hope you can take away and implement in your own business. So you're, when were you doing the recruit? Two to 70 people, that's an enormous leap in the number of employees. When, what was the timing of that? Um, so this was really 2017 to 2019, so obviously very different timing to where we are now. Um, but the processes that we use there were very similar to everything that I've done. I mean, I've worked for some of the largest companies in the world. I've recruited for Rolls-Royce, Virgin, um, Chemist Warehouse in Australia, and, and also Telstra. So um, I took all this experience from these great businesses and implemented those processes in my, in my business. And it was difficult, you know, to try to run a business and the expansion and, and trying to find great people. And, you know, I think the biggest thing for me was is, is giving people a, a go. Like, you know, if you, it all depends on what you need to do in your business. You know, if you need someone really quickly, uh, then you've got to move quickly. If you need somebody but you can, can wait around for a bit and you want the ideal person, then that's totally fine as well. And there's different processes you're going to take and really... If it's immediate, you need them quick. It's really looking at the the best of a bad situation and looking what you've got right now. And if you have to move, then you've got to move. And that's where further in the further on in the conversation we're going to have is is on about training and induction and and how you can bring somebody with no experience at all and trust them and believe in them and believe in your business and what you do because what they do is just going to copy you. And so, um, you know, bringing people with no experience at all can work really well. We understand that you've got to have a nice mixture of experience and people who don't have as much experience. But there's definitely things you can do along this process that will help you have less risk bringing in someone in without um, any experience. And there's a few tips down the line that I'll talk about. But, um, but yeah, it's, 
it's really just having a look and, and, and when you get the resumes is trying to think outside of the box of, of what you're looking at. And I suppose with my experience with companies like Rolls-Royce and, and Virgin and even Chemist Warehouse where I'd sat in their HR departments, sometimes you have to bring out the experience from someone else is last job or it could have been two, three jobs ago and tell the manager, look, I know you want this person, but this person has got very similar experience for a very similar company, but just because they don't call it the same things. And yes, they might mean this might mean that they need more training and more education through the, their onboarding side of things. Well, we should be doing that as businesses anyway. We shouldn't be, um, you know, a lot of our clients turn around to us and say, we want them to hit the ground running. Well, there's no such thing. Even if you've got a dental nurse who has got 15 years experience, well, your dentist works in a different way, your receptionist works in a different way, your systems are very different, and you have to educate and train these people. And, and if you get that part right, that's the key part. If you get the training and induction part right, then you don't, you can employ anyone you want, skilled or non-skilled. And that's really what I would be pushing people to do, is to have a look at their educational part of their business. And this isn't just for the new hires, it's for continual education of your people you've got already and um, putting them into like a training academy. It's a, now is a really good time for you to create something that is going to last you forever. It's going to take you maybe a month to get it right and yes, it might cost you a lot of money, but in the long run, you're going to save that over and over again because you can create the content with amazing people out there who can create animated platforms for you and, and, and specific learning tools for your business. And it's going to look like your, your business. It's going to sound like your business. And once it's done, it's a platform that is there for someone to do in their own time. Um, and it's not going to take your time. It's not going to take your senior nurse's time to train them. And it's you know, or just giving them a, a, a platform to follow a path down and they can see their end goal and, and the, the end goal is for them to be self-sufficient in your business. And it's very easy to create this system. It just takes a lot of time to do it. And I think that's where we succeeded was we took a chance on people who didn't have a lot of experience. And as an example of that, we hired a lot of people from places like Kmart and McDonald's and Hungry Jack's and all these places but we looked at for the senior people, so we knew that they'd been gone through some great training, they'd been worked really hard, like standing on their feet and doing whatever it might be, so we knew that they had it in them to be something extra and something different. So we took away that experience, and we already knew that they could learn because they'd already become a senior person within one of these large companies. So we just took that experience and, and that knowledge and said, hey, this is what you did there, now this is what you're going to do here. And we showed them step by step and trained them over you know, a six month period. Uh, and I suppose the key part of it all was to make sure when they started in the first week they were productive because nothing worse than being hired and then just sat there watching for the first two weeks. Like, it's the worst thing you can do. Now get them doing something, something that's going to support the dentist or the nurse or doing something. Uh, you know, if we talk about receptionists, well, get them on the phone. Or listen to this phone call. This is the phone call. The next phone call, I'm going to do it again. The next phone call, jump on the phone. You're only going to learn that way, and it makes you feel good about yourself because you're making a difference. If I'm sat there for two weeks just watching you, I'm going to be bored. <laughs> so. Yeah, and I think from what you said at the start there, getting our expectations right from the very start is a wonderful first step, isn't it? Because I think you're right. I think a lot of people say we just need to have someone sitting there in the dental surgery with the dentist holding the suction and passing all the instruments and we need that person quick or we need that person to replace the receptionist who's just quit and we need that person to answer the phone and we need them quick and we want them to hit the ground running and to recognise what a huge ask that is. And because if we don't check in with our expectations from the start, everything becomes a frustration for us and a big laborious task for us and we can't see the opportunities within it all. So I think checking our expectations from the very start is a fantastic first step and realising that the performance of a new employee coming in, it there's a 50% responsibility on that new employee you know, bringing the, all the skills and characteristics to the table and performing well, but there's also a 50% responsibility with the owner and the existing team to create the environment for this person to be successful. That's exactly, that's exactly right. And, and all of this starts way before um, 
you know, you, you might go, okay, well, we need, we need, I need a new nurse. And that's when all this starts from that point. You know, writing the job advert in a way uh, that's going to be attractive to the candidates that you want to try and, trying to attract. But thinking about your business of, in a different way. So many businesses think of, oh, employees, oh, you know, they're going to come and work for me. I'm going to pay them a wage. If we start to think of it in a different way, and this is what I try to say to a lot of candidates, um, is stop seeing yourself as you're coming to be employed by this person. You're sharing your skills and experience with this business, and they're paying you for that skills and experience. Once you start to think about a business transaction, that it's the same as what I do. You know, I recruit for a lot of other businesses. Um, it's the same as what you've got to do in your own business. You've got to look at it and go, hey, you know, this person has got to come in and do this, this, and this. Um, but they're providing us with their skills and experience. Not that they're coming for a job. They're going to share that experience with us. And also the, the mentality of how you think about employing people changes because we do it all we do so many different things with trust like i use zero i trust that already um, and i use banks and things like that so by having somebody come into your business who you can be a partner with it changes the relationship a bit different you get more out of somebody if they believe that they're part of a company and they're partnered with that company to, to achieve the goals of, of that business. And as long as you're open and honest about that, uh, I, I honestly believe with the right training, anyone can do anything. And um, it's you know looking through what you feel is a good employee for that position, what skills do they need. You know, nursing is probably you know one percent of the job uh in, in my mind um because that can be trained like there's so many other things that you can do with somebody with a different background rather than bringing someone in from dental yes they're great because they understand or everything already you just got to show them what you've got the, the basics of what you do as a business the downside to bringing someone like that is the worst thing i've ever heard oh i know how to do that already that's the worst thing you can say to anybody because it's like, okay, I understand you know how to do it your way and then you've got to try and train them out of the way that they're doing it. So, you know, there's so many things that that affect bringing someone into your business and the key point is just changing that mindset of this person is coming in, they're a partner in my business and once you start to think and talk like that, the relationship is so much better because they love you for it because they feel like they're part of the business. And so changing just the, the, the wording of it and saying, I want someone to come in and partner with us. I want them to be a great you know, dental, whatever it might be, rather than going, OK, this person's going to come and work for me. I'm going to pay them a wage and this is what they're going to do. You know, there's a better relationship to have with your employees. Certainly is a better relationship to have. And when we're talking about dental practices, more often than not, we're, we are talking about small groups of, te- of people. We're not talking about 80 people under the one roof. We are talking about, you know, five to 30 people under the one roof and all with differing schedules. They may, you know, some team members don't even end up communicating with each other or see, working with each other. But it is a lovely time to think to yourself, because the normal mindset around recruitment for a dental practice is let's find a bunch of candidates and we will deem which one we find appropriate enough to come and work with us who ticks the boxes and flip that around and think, do you tick the boxes of this candidate? Depending on the level of experience and the age of the person that you're bringing on board, you were saying before, you know, they may have had many uh, jobs in the past and they could have had great jobs and bad jobs and um, positive team environments and great bosses and terrible bosses. And so they come into you with their own set of expectations as well. So you might say, you're the best candidate. We're going to offer you the job. But what's happening nowadays is that candidate's going, oh, hang on one second. I'm not quite sure if I want to work for you, if you meet my criteria yet. Criteria. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's definitely interesting times, and we are seeing candidates want more from the from from their the, from the interview. Let's not even talk about the job. You know, their, the expectations are, are changing, and, and obviously, the world of dental is a little bit different to some other industries where you know the flexibility can't be there. You know, as a nurse, you have to be in the surgery at the moment. Anyway, who knows what's going to happen with robotics and things like that in the future? But um, yeah, the candidates want more from businesses they want to have more say in the interview they want to have more say in their working hours and what that what happens within from their side of their employment if we clear or their partnership and um there's definitely going to be more conversations that happen and we're going to see stronger and stronger candidates who come through who say hey you know 
you say you're the best. What makes you the best? Because I've got another, I've got I had an interview two days ago with another dental practice. They say they're the best. So I want to know what makes you different. And, you know, and why should I come and work for you? I, I do some training with a, uh, with a charity where I get candidates come to me. We go through their resumes and we do talk about interview prep. And the biggest thing is for candidates is to ask those quest, ask questions of the, of the employer because we've all been in this system where it's all the other way. It's all we're always about the employer. And we've definitely seen that change now because of you know, COVID and all these things that happened over the last two years. Candidates are, are, are like, we don't need we don't need this anymore. Like we've got all these options. We've got we can you know we're not bound by the employer anymore. So it's all about teamwork and, and and finding that right fit for both parties. And I think that employers have got to take more time in the interview, not just to find out about what skills they have and how they think and all of these things that you know all the recruiters tell you and HR people you know about a good fit and getting psychometric tests and all of that. You know, what does the candidate really want? You know, what, you know, what do they want from a company? What do they want as support? You know, how long do you think you're going to be here? You know, if you, t- two years, okay, well, two years is not a bad tenure, really, especially in this day and age. You know, so what can we do to make, support you through that? You know, what training do you need? And, and, and more of a conversation around, rather than it being an interview, I think that even that word has got to change at some point. Um, uh, it's just a conversation between two parties with who can provide different services and one's going to pay the other for that service. And um, yeah, I think it's going to be interesting times ahead. And uh, I think as candidates get stronger and more confident, because they're going to apply for four or five jobs they're going to get four or five interviews and then it's going to twig they're going to go ha oh, i'm getting all these interviews you know i don't have to kind of beg someone for me to go and work for them i can sit back and have all the control yeah that's a great term i don't have to sit here and beg somebody for, to give me a job and this is as you say this is where the times are changing and i think it's a good idea for employers to embrace that process embrace that the in, the candidates are coming through with their own series of questions to make sure you kind of come up to par as well because if you do embrace that process for a start you don't resist it and you don't resent resent it when that those great candidates start asking these questions but if both sides are coming into it with that genuine desire to meet and match each other's needs and requirements, you end up with a very strong coupling where both sides, uh, you're, you're working towards the same values, you've got the same level of professionalism and you appreciate the same things. And so that's going to be a, a much happier union and a longer union than if, than if those sort of ideas weren't being addressed during the recruitment process and it reminds me of Daniel Pink's book Drive and he identified within it the three main drivers as human beings is autonomy, mastery and purpose and so autonomy of course don't micromanage people allow them to learn the skills and then just get the practice and repetition underway themselves mastery so continuing to upskill and develop skills existing skills within people to the point where they are really good at it but purpose recognize that the values and purpose of your practice will either or either not resonate with the purpose of that individual themselves. And in it, if they, if you find somebody joining your team with that shared purpose, that is a very strong driver of their behaviour moving forward. Massively, and I think um, a lot of businesses can learn from that and go, okay, well, if we change how we speak to our candidates as they come in or interviews or however we're going to term it, uh, what term we're going to use and say to them and just talk about values and talk about the goals of the business and and i see so many and i've been i've been part of this as well especially before where the interview is really there to try and trip the candidate up it's kind of like can you give us an example of when you've dealt with a hard patient or stuff like that. and they're great questions to understand as a business owner how they're going to deal with it but why not talk about you know values and say you know these are our values. Where do you see your, where you fit in with these? And there's got to be total honesty. You know, so many candidates will say what they think you want to hear because they want the job, and that's where it takes you know a really skilled uh, business owner to work out whether that person is telling the truth or not. But you can you know ask questions and delve into that. But you know matching the values and the purpose of the business and what they're going to do in the role and the, what's the goal of that. And, and, and even talking about the aspirations of the business, you know, we, we all, uh, as business owners, have um, some sort of goal, whether it's to you know, do more turnover than last year or to open another surgery or whatever. But that excites candidates. They want to be part of something. 
They want to be part of something. They don't just want a job. They want to be a partnership. And this is where the partnership comes in so much. Um, and they want to help that business grow because they're going to grow with it. And whether it's for, they're going to be there for a year or two years, it's just getting the most out of that person uh, and get the best out of that person so they can move on to and be a better person than when, when they started with you. There's nothing better to see a person who come to you then grow and then they go, I'm going to resign because I've got this opportunity. And I'll go, as long as you're going to something that's going to better you uh, and, and you're taking all these skills away from us, you know, I don't want you to go. Obviously, don't want you to go, but you can't control that. But, uh, but you know, fair play to you. And I'm proud of that because I, you're going onto a position where you've learned skills with us and now you're moving on to the next stage. And you know, we've just got to be open with that and allow it to happen. Yes, it reminds me of uh, one of the first jobs that I had and I was, you know, late teens, early 20s and it was a great practice to work for and the main boss, who was an older gentleman, and when any person went up and any of the dental nurses went up and handed in their resignation, he would say, congratulations, because he saw that's the natural progression in life. We're supposed to want to get better and better and then master certain skills. And then all of a sudden, the position that we currently hold becomes something that's meant to be in our past because we're moving on to better things. And you know, we to have the expectation that we get a team together and we never have to rehire again, we're going to be constantly disappointed. <laughs> and they do have, say you should always be recruiting as a company. And that Lesson came home with a recent client who went through the process of hiring a new receptionist. And the receptionist candidates were coming that were coming through commented on the Facebook page of this particular practice. You all look like such a strong team who really care about each other and celebrate your wins. And I want them to be part of that. And this is what you're talking about, that applicants are coming in and they want to be part of something that's more than just about themselves. Yeah, and, and, and even to more, more than the pay as well. Um, you know, I can compare my jobs that I've had and I've worked in uh, as an employee for, for companies. The pay was never that great, but it was more about, you know, what I could gain from that in my career-wise and what I could learn and, and from these people within this business or the businesses I've worked for and take the good parts of that and, the, and leave the bad parts and then move on to the next position and, most business owners have been an employee at some at some stage, and I think we have to go back into ourselves and back into our history and go. Oh, when I was an employee, you know, I stayed there for X amount of time. You know, remember those feelings that you had as you came to the end of that tenure, and you're, oh, I think it's time to move on. You now we all get to that point, we, and, and businesses need fresh blood, as you as you mentioned. We need to bring new people in to get new ideas, bring new energy into the business. And I'm not saying that all the people that you have right now are not the right people, but it can get a bit stale. We need to bring, you know, this new energy can come in. And, you know, if we're looking at bringing in 20 to 25 year old, and I look at when I was 20, 25, oh my God, like the amount of jobs I had in that time period was ridiculous. And so many people turn around to us and go, oh, you know, this person's never going to stay because, yeah, but you got to look at when you were doing that, you know, you did it as well. And that's just the age group we're attracting. You know, if you want to bring in somebody with, more um who's you know got better tenure more better experience well then you can't pay the award rate for a 20 or two year old so you know you've got to pay you've got to pay for the, for that experience so it's really working out exactly what you need as we mentioned earlier on and working out what that person's about but definitely bringing in new people is always a positive people see it as a negative because oh this person's leaving it must mean they're meaning a bad employer that's just life like unless you're a sole trader you just do it on your own and if you want to build a successful business, you're going to need people, and people are always going to leave. You know, have this yeah, maybe just a two, natural two order. Years time. <laughs> That's right. Great. Okay. Cool. Okay. See you later. Thanks for staying. Thanks for your time. But appreciate it. Appreciate all your hard work. You know, is there anything we can do to make you stay? You know, the worst thing you can do is offer more money because they forget about the money and the problems. If they've got problems, are always going to be around. Um, and if the problems aren't fixable, then there's no harm in letting them go and freeing them to the next position and allowing some fresh blood to come in and, 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 and seeing the positive side of that. Mm, absolutely. And I was having a conversation with Charles, the co-founder of Julie Parker Practice Success and my husband, and he's been heavily involved in teams for a long, long time. And I was having a chat with him uh, when we were allowed to go out in Victoria. <laughs> 
<laughs> about the recruitment challenges, about getting down. You know, I, I was getting calls all the time from dental practices saying we need a receptionist, we need a nurse, we can't find anybody. And Charles said to me, if you got a Jessica, now Jessica is my niece and she's 13, 14, gosh, 13 or 14, and she's just happy, confident, out there, you know, we'll try anything new. And he said, if you've got a character like Jessica coming in for a job, you know, if she was of, uh, of age, how long would it take to train her to be a dental nurse? And my initial response was, oh, my gosh, it'll be forever. Let me have a think. And then I thought about it and I said, wow, I'm really surprised at my answer. I think it would take half a day. <laughs> half a day to teach someone what the basic materials are, how to suction, how to bring a patient through. But then everything after that is just the practice and repetition we need to go through to master those skills. But to actually train the skills themselves takes a very short time. And I encourage employers out there to have a think about that. How long do you think it would take to train somebody with great characteristics, great enthusiasm, a uh, caring personality type that just wants to please the patient and please the team they're working with how long would it take to train those skills up and it's such a short time and as they say you know you're stuck with an attitude from somebody for a long long time and would you be also encouraging people start tapping into the non-experienced employees out there that have no idea about dental and just start to try to appeal to those characteristics that would suit your team beautifully. Yeah, I mean, everyone's got to start somewhere. And especially if we're talking, you know, uh, like just uh, you know, trainee nurses coming in and I'm um, talking about the, like younger people in these kind of positions. We've all got to start somewhere. Like someone gave me a chance in recruitment and it was quite funny. I was talking to that person um, only a couple of months ago and just talking about our experience together when I work with her. Because it's always interesting when you speak to an old boss about five, five ten years later <laughs> and speak to them because you get so much more information out of it. So I was like, why did you hire me? Like, I had no experience. And they went, because you came in, you were bubbly, you were bright, you had great attitude, you were just kind of like, come on, let's go and do stuff, let's go and like, and they wanted that in their business. And so, yes, they had to train me, and you know, but we're, we're, you know, we're talking systems and how to answer a phone. We're not talking, like, keyhole surgery <laughs> like I you know they're not going to be the dentist they're going to pass you equipment and you're going to go you know pass me the scale or whatever and they, yes they might pass you the wrong thing and they might do that for the next 10 times but at some point they're going to get it and you know if you get the right attitude and you know they've been work for good companies and you can see that they've worked hard in that in those companies yes you're going to do your reference checks and all this kind of thing uh, and they, all those things are going to add up but just the amount of time and the amount of money it will save you in the long run. Um, as an example, I remember I was working at Chemist Warehouse as, a, as the, the recruiter. We had to hire another recruiter. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to be swamped. It's, it's going to take me so long. So, But I just triggered in my head, hold on a minute. If I spend three full days with this recruiter and not do any of my own work, then I'm, in three weeks' time, I'm going to be further ahead than if I didn't spend time with them and let them just get on with what they were doing. So that's why I let my work fall down because I knew that once I got her up to speed, I can go, hey, here's 50% of my work now. Can you, can you catch up on that work and through the steps that I've shown you? So there's plenty of ways that we can train these people, um, and, and, but we have to take the time out of our day because we want to make sure that they're going to be right and doing what they're doing. So you might think our oh, three days of having no patience is, is crazy, but imagine having four months without a nurse. <laughs> so you, it, it's going to work in both ways. And, and, and one of the best things I did was when I worked for, I worked for a large hotel chain in the UK called Premier Inn, and they had this six-month induction, a buddy system, and it was the best thing I ever saw because what happened was the new employee got put with the best per the best person, the best employee. This person, and, th and this is where you've got to be really careful. You've got to get this person right. You want to be able to get the person who is you know loves the company, loves everything about it, because all that's going to happen, all that is just going to wash onto the new person, and they're going to become a duplicate of that person. We all go, we want double of ourselves well that's never going to happen uh, but we can get similar kind of training done by someone we really like and who we know can do the job and you know go and sit with them go okay well you're going to be with this person three days you're going to start at the same time you're going to go for lunch at the same time you're going to see the same patients 
And all of a sudden, this person's going to absorb all that information. And then on the flip side of it, if we do put them with a bad employee, then all they're going to do is go, ah, oh, there's the shortcuts. Oh, I don't have to start until five past nine. Oh, I can go for lunch whenever I want because that's what the person did. So there's plenty of ways we can structure it. And at the end of the day, it just takes time, but it's always going to take you time. And it's better to get it done in a, at the very beginning and, and, and so it can benefit you quicker rather than you know, stretching it out. And so having a great person who you can go, hey, this is the person, this is your buddy for the next three months, three days, whatever it might be. Uh, but then you've got to have training material and all these things, yes, take time. But once you've got it ready, the training material doesn't really change unless your systems change. So for the next 50 people you bring into your business, there's the, the, here, here's your training manual. This is the buddy. Um, by Friday, you should be knowing all the instruments. By the following Friday, you should be you know, with the dentist on your own. And having these key history points, these markers, where that person can look ahead, but also can look back and go, oh, so three weeks ago, I didn't even know what a scalar was. And now I'm sitting with a dentist, dealing with a patient, dealing with suction. And the person buzzes from it because I've learned so much. I love it. I love that idea of the buddy system. That's just tremendous. And I've also often said to uh, clients and club members that you will find that each one of your employees has a particular excels particularly well in a particular area and you may not get one employee that excels in all the areas but when you bring in a new recruit you could say you know look at Sally and the way she presents herself physically to work every day her hair is neat her uniform's always iron she's got sensible shoes on her nails you know, are well manicured she is the standard for appearance and then look at Jenny and the way Jenny answers the phone to incoming calls she does it beautifully well and there is nothing like coming into an environment where you're trying to learn something to the expectations of another person and usually the big challenge is the person who has the expectations doesn't communicate them clearly enough and so the person trying to learn is left thinking I know I'm not coming up to par I don't know why but to be able to say either through a, a video a training video which is your standing operating procedure for the whatever for infection control or answering the phone or buddy up with that person for the day and learn that particular skill from them and actually seeing it in action, there's nothing more effective in terms of recognising what the expectations of that other person are. That's it. And there's so many basic procedures within any business that a new employee should be able to come in and be productive within the first two days. Even the first day, uh, in, in, the, in the dental business that I was um, part of, I had... Um, my process was the person would sit with me for the first half of the day uh, because I wanted them to sit with the owner of a business like because it because it feels good like oh my god I've got to sit with the owner I've got to sit here and he's going to tell me what uh, I went through all the history of the business and then I even trained them on the basic system of we, we used to have forms that have to be data entry into the system and there I would show them how to do one or two they would then jump on they would show me how to do those two or three then I'd have like maybe 50 of them to go. So I'd go, okay, well, you know, now go and sit with the team leader. This person's going to be your buddy for however long. But your first job is to enter these in. So by the first two days, not only have they been productive, but they're feeling great about being productive. And so there's so many things we can set up and that will allow people to feel part of the business straight away, but also make them productive straight away because at the end of the day, that's what we need them to be. And it can work really well, you know, but you've got to try things out. If you don't try it, you don't know. And you know, finding the right people to be buddies and the right you know, training information. And technology is so good. With, um, I use a free screen recorder to do mine. I sat there. It took me a day. And all I did is went through every process and just talked about what I was clicking on and where I went. It recorded it for me. It put into a nice little file. So when someone started, I had five steps to do whatever it was and they could just watch the video and then, then they went away and just did it and then someone checked the work and that went on for maybe two or three weeks and then after that it was the end that was it you you're now doing the job without any any training and the only thing we've got to do is train you on new things as they come down the line I think the training videos are such a wonderful thing, you know, because you know, you're not, they're not just used once, they're used many times for all, the, all your recruiting purposes, but also they are housed within your practice manual, your digital practice manual as 
uh, your standard operating procedures. One of the enormous benefits, you know, we've just talk, talked about it clarifies expectation, but another big benefit of the training video is under the old fashioned way of you teach Sally. And then a couple of years later of Sally doing the thing, in, and it, it morphs into the way Sally does it. Sally then trains Jenny, who's the new recruit, and it's slightly different to the way she was that Sally was taught. But then Jenny learns the new way, the new updated way. It may not be as good, maybe not at the same standard. It may include some of the shortcuts that you're talking about before. And then after that, um, Jody comes on board, and Jenny trains Jody and team member by team member the purpose the standard of that system is whittled down when you've got one authentic video that everyone goes back to and retrains and trains themselves on you're maintaining that standard and the purpose behind that system that's yeah that's exactly right and um it's a bit like chinese whispers isn't it that people can talk about anything they want and the, the end message can be so different and the good thing about having this in uh, we could say writing but in, being recorded is that every year you can put everyone through it and go you know and, and there's nothing to say that the, these can't be changed because the good thing about writing your systems and processes down you can see where they're inefficient and go ah oh, we don't do that anymore or we do this instead and so you can then change it or you can look at it and go why do we do that like well, we don't need to do that there because it's already done here and so all of a sudden you start to become more efficient because you're doing a training video and you can see where things fall down or improvements need. And like you say, they're always going to be there. So in a year's time, we can get everyone in and we can go, OK, well, we'll let's we'll go for the training video. and Let's do a practice patient or whatever it might be. And, and it is a test, really, just to make sure that they're following the guidelines of you as a business owner of how you want them to do things, because your business is successful because of the implementation of your processes and systems that you've done, and then people have got to follow that. And it's it's the same as if we look at franchises. McDonald's is the the key point of it. Every play, every McDonald's in the world makes a Big Mac in the same way because that's the most efficient way to make it, and that's how they make the most money. So why can't it work for dental and any other business? It should be exactly the same. Your process is what your business is built on, and the people who are implementing that process have to follow it. And you, But you've got to implement that. If you don't implement it, then people are just going to go, oh, oh, we don't do that. We don't enter that in anymore because... Sarah said we don't have to do it. Well, Sarah is just the you know, practice manager. The policy says you should enter it in. Well, then you should be entering it in. Yeah, for sure. And I am always aware, because I've felt it myself, and I think we've all felt this ourselves at our new locations where we go and start a job, just the importance of self-confidence and how quickly that self-confidence can be dragged down because they're not properly supported in this new role. Yeah, it's um, we, we, you know, we've all been there. It's nervous starting a new job anyway, but that is the, you know, you've got probably got about, you know, your probation period is three to six months and it's there, for, it's there for a reason. Obviously, if it's not working out on both parties, you can separate ways. But it's also there because the enthusiasm of the new employee and, and the excitement of that person is there for that period of time. And if we can tap into that at the right and that moment, that's when they're going to be open to everything. If you're turning around to them at the eight-month point, so they've gone past probation, and you're going, oh, by the way, you're not doing that right, they're going to go, yeah, but I'm doing it. <laughs> because you're not showing them. Right, so, so that period of time is just so exciting for everybody, and so everyone should be involved in that excitement, and they should be um, having this conversation of expectations uh, on their first few days of this is what's going to happen by week four, you should be self self-sufficient we expect you to be self-sufficient by that and, and you know that's totally fine as long as they know but if you're turning around to them on the fourth week and going oh why are you not doing this by now they're going to go oh, i didn't know i had to <laughs> you you know you haven't given me anything to, to go along you know we all are, have targets as business owners we have dates we've got to do certain things everyone needs the same thing and having structure and having um you know the same things to do over and over again people go it's so boring but as humans, we work better like that. We work better if we have to do the same thing over and over again because we try and you know, um, make it easy for us to do. And it's we want it to be second nature. And so you know, planning a real good training induction for this person, when they turn up, they know that, that you know that they're coming. There's nothing worse than knocking on the door and then people go, oh, who are you? <laughs> Tell the team. <laughs> you know, I've had some great – I work for some great businesses where they brought me in a week before I started. 
I and I was like, that's a bit weird, I've never done this before. Came in, I had champagne, everyone took the afternoon off, we had some food together, we just got to know, and obviously you can't do it in every business, but why can't you bring them in after hours and say, hey guys, can we just stay behind for just for 10 minutes, we've got a new employee coming, I want you to meet them, I want them to make them feel at home, you know, show them where everything is, make sure they've got all the equipment. We, in the dental business, we got the scrubs ready three weeks before they started, ideally, so when they, so they had them before they started, so they didn't feel like, oh my God, I mean, Another surgery scrubs, or I mean, my own clothes. Uh, everyone can see me. I'm so different, and I stand. I stand out. Whereas, you know, we want them to make them feel welcome. We want them to be like they've been there before. And um, once, if you, especially with that introduction out of hours, gets away that nervous. Oh my god, it's my first day. I've got to meet all these new people. The first day becomes their second day, and everyone knows. Oh, second. Ah, oh, I know Dave already. <laughs> because I've met him two days ago, a week ago. But I love that idea, having some sort of social interaction beforehand, just so everyone can get that likability going. That's it, that's it. And it just takes away um, the unknown. And what I've found, um, especially over the last year with, with Zoom, is I've met a lot of business owners on Zoom, and I've done a lot of networking with business owners. But when I've met them face-to-face, after having an hour Zoom meeting, it's like I've known them for years because I've t- already met them. <laughs> like, it's not like a meeting for the first time. So, you know, these guys are going to be the same. They're going to be nervous. They're going to be excited. Uh, you know, meeting a new team that's not on their first day. Okay, we've got a pa- Imagine knocking on the door, walking in, the patient follows you in, and then all of a sudden the attraction of the patient is the, is the attracting part rather than the new employee. Uh, you know, then it kind of, like, makes you feel a bit, bit down and if it continues to do that over the time period they're just going to not be bothered and then you're going to go oh you know you weren't the same person you were in the interview I say well no wonder because <laughs> yeah. you, 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 you know you're treating me in such a different way and um people want more people want more and more from the employer and they want to be happy and they're happy from day one and um if not they're just going to go see you later i've got another five jobs i can go and apply for i've got another four offers that i didn't take because i took your job yeah, and it's just open and honest, honest conversation. I mean, I'm painting a good picture and saying, no, you know, we're a great company. We've got great processes. We're going to give you training. And, you know, you not know, all businesses are like that. You know, there's probably more businesses that aren't. But be honest with them. Say, hey, right, we're getting smashed right now, mate. You know, there's, you know systems aren't that great. We've got issues here. We've got issues here. You know, we're fighting through them. We've got pl- we've got plans or but you've got to be honest with them. You know, if you are planning to make it better, then well, talk about it to them. Talk about it to the team. You know, make sure everyone is involved because as a, it's lonely as a business owner. Don't think it's all down to you. At the end of the day, other people are dealing with your processes on a daily basis and they're going to give you the best advice of what you think should change. Um, and so if it is a hard time in the business at the moment and things aren't so great, then say, you know, hey, I'm going to be honest with you because I'd rather you find out now in the interview rather than four months down the line when I've tried to get you on board and, and, and give you an induction training or whatever, wasted that time. So, hey, you're a great candidate. I just want to be open and honest with you. We've got a few issues with some of the team. We're trying to work it out. Um, but we feel you're going to come in and you're going to help change that balance. And, you know, be positive. Always trying to put a positive spin at the end. But there's nothing worse than walking into a business and going, hey, you said it was amazing. You said you went for pizzas on a Friday. Well, that, apparently that only happened once and all these things. You know, there's nothing worse than turning up somewhere and find out someone lied in the interview when it's a candidate. So how do you make it, how do you think it feels if it's an employer who's lied? It's even worse. That's right. That's right because if we just flipped the tables over and if a candidate had come in and they seemed fantastic but they withheld crucial information such as their availability for a couple of months every year because they're – they need, they need to travel or whatever, you'd be pissed. <laughs> and so likewise, it's true. Both sides need to bring all the key information, pertinent information to the table up front uh, because you don't want to try break any kind of trust moving forward. That's difficult to come back from. them. It is. And, and you know, I've recruited a lot of people in my life and um, sometimes – you get a call from a candidate who started a new job and you're like, oh, you don't want that call on the first day. It's never never a good call on the first day. And I go, what's wrong? And they go, I don't even have a computer. I don't even have a desk. They didn't even know I was coming. And I was like, it's terrible. All of a sudden, you've gone from this person who's ready to change the world for you and be an amazing employee and you failed them on the first day. So what do you expect you're going to get from them? You, know, you might get lucky. You might get someone who goes, 
that was crap, that was really crap, but I'm, I can change that for you. I know that was bad, so I'm going to implement that myself. And that's what I've done for businesses. I've gone, oh, your induction wasn't great, let's change it, and because that's the kind of person I am. But some people are going to go in and go, oh, this is a nightmare, let's just leave. <laughs> I'm going to go and find another job because if they're not going to give me a computer on the day one, then and they didn't even know I was coming, what's going to happen when it comes to payday? They haven't even... I haven't even got a contract, I haven't got bank details being passed on, even, they haven't even asked me for my super details. So all these little key points give a really good sign to that person what's going to happen in the future. And, um, you know, not, not everyone is perfect, and I don't understand that, but there's definitely ways, simple ways you can do things, you know, checklists of, of when you bring a new employee, what employee a, new, a new employee on, what happens. And, um, you know, if you're having a conversation with someone and you're saying, I want you to be self-sufficient in four weeks. And you're also giving them a commitment from yourself about something. Well, then put a date on it. Put it in your calendar, but make sure you hit it. Because if you don't hit it, you're going to lose some of that trust. The same as if you're saying to that candidate, oh, you've got to be self-sufficient in four weeks. And they're not. Well, then either A, you haven't given them enough training, or then you just need a little bit more. But it's got to work both ways. And um, I, I think more business owners are going to see this over the next few years uh, you know, the biggest thing I hear is I want them to hit the ground running or I want them to be like me. I'm like, well, okay, if you want them to be like you, you're going to give them 50% of the profit because then no one's going to be like you. No one's going to be like you because you're special. We're all special in our own way. But if you want this person to do exactly what like you do and want them to be like you, well, then you've got to make them a business owner and give them that pressure of being a business owner. They're an employee. They have their set guidelines of what to do. Make sure you give them their guidelines and everything they need to do their job before they start it. I've seen some amazing other inductions from other dental, large dental groups, and they go through a whole training process before you're even allowed in the in the surgery. And yes, it takes time, but it means that when they come in the surgery, they can hit the ground running <laughs> because you've shown them three to four weeks beforehand before they've started. And then you get obviously well, people go, well, we have to pay them for that. So, well, would you rather pay them? Like so they're not taking up space in the surgery and they're learning and they're getting something done or would you rather them to come in on the first day and then train them for four weeks and then they're still going to be you know no better off and um, so as much as much information beforehand that you can give them you know if it's training contact details of people getting them to meet the team getting them to come in especially if they've never been a dental nurse and they've only been a patient at a dental practice well then they're going to see it very differently to a dental nurse so bring them into the environment with no patients in there, no drills going off. Let them touch things because who doesn't want to know what the, dent the drill feels like because I've never touched one because I'm, a, I'm normally a patient. You know, why does it make that noise? All these things are these questions that you can answer without them taking your precious time up <laughs> when you've actually got a patient. Oh, why does it do that? And the patient's like, uh, why are you talking about this right now? <laughs> I don't want to know. I don't want to know. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> So what the, the usual process that a practice would go through is writing a job ad which lists the responsibilities down. They all have the same kind of things. We want someone who's caring and professional and committed <laughs> and you see the same things over and over again. And then they usually you know, choose a selection of the applicants, bring them in for an in-person interview. It's probably been Zoom interviews to date. And then they put somebody on. They Sometimes they're clear about a trial period, sometimes they're not. And then cross the fingers, let's hope everything moves ahead smoothly. What's the process that you would suggest for a dental practice who, for example, would like to hire a new dental assistant? Um. So a job ad is, is very generic anyway. Like you can you can write whatever you want in it to, to make the company look good and things like that. So there's no issues with that. Um, so one, it's the next stages that are important to me. And it's all about time saving as well. So what we do as a business, as a recruitment company, we use recorded video interviews. And what that allows us to do is to get a really good feel of the candidate. We ask them um, some you know, great questions to do with the job. So when they're talking about the, their experience, we can hear what they're talking about. We can see if it makes sense to us. We can see their passion. We can see, if, you know, if we're talking about a salesperson and they're like, oh my God, you know, yeah, I like sales. Well, that's probably not the person you're going to hire. If they're like, yeah, I've got a target of 100 people. I make 400 phone calls and, and, and they're really buzzing. Well, that's the kind of person you want, you know, and you're getting this information 
from a recorded video interview. So we use a system called My Interview. I suggest that there's a free version of it, uh, depending on how many hires you want to make in a year or depending on how much it costs, but it's very, very cheap. And what it allows you to do is meet candidates before, it take, before taking your time out to meet the candidate. And, and so, you know, then you can determine, okay, well, I've got 10 candidates. Let's say five of them are video shortlisting, but three of them have dental experience and two of them don't. Well, then you can look at it and go, well, okay, well, this person's got a really good attitude, but she's got no experience in dental. Okay, well, this other person's got loads of experience in, but she sounds like she's a bit of a, you know, she's going to come Dad. and make things, yeah, <laughs> just going through the motions, you know, and it just gives you so much information. So then once you have that, then you can then go, you know, let's go to the, the face-to-face interview stage and, um, you know, start to talk about that partnership and say, hey, I, I understand that you don't have any experience. I, I understand that. But I really like your attitude. And if you're willing to work hard and follow this set path that I'm going to set for you to train you how to do this job, because you can't just turn up on the first day and go, I know what that is. Uh, then why can't you just employ anyone that you want? You know, you, yes, the attitude has got to count. You know, it doesn't matter who you recruit in this world. People go, you know, you, you know. If they don't stay for the first six months, then it's a bad hire. Yeah, but you can't control people's lives. You can't control people. People are going to leave you if they're going to leave anyway. You know, it could be they're going to move. If something happened with a family, they might get into it and go, do you know what? It wasn't exactly what I thought it was. And that's fine. But, you know, the key thing is to move on. It's not to dwell on that and go, oh, my God, I'm a really bad business owner. We're really bad business. Look at the situation. What, what could you change? Nothing. Okay, well, then just move on to the next, next thing. And don't let, don't waste any time dwelling on it. Oh my God, what did we do wrong? Well, sometimes it's just not a fit. Yeah, and I think you you got to remain hopeful and heartened through the whole process. Otherwise, if you're if you are completely disheartened about the process, you will be for one putting out that negative vibe. So the kind of rapport that you're building is compromised by your mindset, and it's being picked up by these candidates who are then going to respond in kind in, in sometimes. But also, you will start to only focus on what could possibly be seen as red flags in that candidate rather than seeing the opportunities that that candidate can bring to the table. I love the idea of the my interview. When we spoke previously, Bobby, it just blew my mind. I thought that's such a tremendous thing to do because there is a world of difference reading a resume to actually seeing somebody speak about what makes them come alive, speak about why they want to come and work with you, why they love the industry, what their future plans for their career are. Two very, very different experiences. Definitely. And we've seen Seek have just, um, not recently, but maybe in the last year, uh, have allowed especially recruiters, I'm not sure how it works on a, on, a, on a just a normal system, like on the SEEK system, but we can actually ask the candidate to provide a one-minute recording of them via the application through SEEK. And, and because, you know, a piece of – we can go to a resume writer and go, hey, this is my experience, can you put it in there? And they're going to make it sound like it's not even you. And that's because they want you to get the job that you're applying for. And so – you know, it can be false in a way. And sometimes people aren't great at writing their resume, but they could be the best employee you ever had. But you look at the resume and go, oh, that's not right. So we, we look at the resume, you know, we're looking at certain parts to make sure that they're going to be able to go forward to the next stage. But if we're unsure, why not? It doesn't cost us anything to send them the recorded video interview. The person completes it. We look at it and go, do you know what? This person is nothing like their resume. Let's put, and then we, we actually send the recording to our clients with their resume because we go, hey, look, this is their resume, but this is what they sound like and this is what they, they can do. And it just changes the way that we recruit because we're dealing with a person rather than just the piece of paper. So in the future, the whole world is going to, you know, you've already got Facebook bringing in the meta universe or whatever they're calling it. And so we're all going to be virtual people and we're all going to meet, there will be no resumes. It will be like an open door. We'll have a a recruitment day on a Monday. I'm going to be sat with goggles on. I'm going to be sat wherever I am in the meta universe. And people are going to walk in. I'm going to talk to people as if they're in my practice and that is going to be the interview process i'm going to be interviewing people rather than getting resumes on this maybe in the next 10 years we probably won't even have job boards it will just be mm. people doing that so how long would you suggest what's what's a good length of time is there can you does it come down to that or it really depends on a case-by-case basis it really depends on the other on both people in the interview like so i can talk a lot so I can talk and talk, and, 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 but if the other person is not like that and they need to be drawn out of information, 
And that doesn't mean they're a bad hire because they can't talk in an interview. It drives me mad. Like it drives me mad. People go, oh yeah, but they didn't interview very well. Yeah, but their job isn't to do interviews, is it? And they're like, no, it's to answer the phone. I say, well, why don't you go and get them to answer the phone then? <laughs> like the interview is just really for you to get to know them and go, okay, well, is this person going to be going to fit whatever it might be? So, you know, I've done interviews that have been 15 to 20 minutes long. I've also done interviews that have ended up being two hours because the person hasn't given me, you know, just drawing out those answers from that person. But you've got to be fair to them. You know, they've, they've taken the time out of their day to come and meet you. And, you know, um, I like to really use the behavioral questions, uh, you know, especially if I'm talking to a dental nurse who is, is a dental nurse. And, I, you know, talk about the patient uh, process, how they bring them into the surgery and, you know, what do they do in this situation? What happens if they're scared of the, and all these, all these different questions. So it's really taking the experiences that I had in that situation, in that job, I'm going, I want to know how this person's going to react because I've already had this before and the other nurse I had didn't react very well. And so I want to know how you're going to react when this person starts to bleed out everywhere. You know, what, how, how are you going to do that? And, and just asking questions and just being open with them and really just trying to get the personality out, you know, and even ask them about training. How, how well do you, do you take new information on? Oh, do you know what? It, I don't really like to learn new things. Well, okay, well, that, that is a red flag because you have to take, teach them. If they're not going to teach, learn the way that you want to do it, then there's no point. You know, if you bring someone in who has you know, completed their master's or bachelor's or whatever it is, well, at least you know that they have completed something and they can learn. And so, okay, well, there's a good point. So then you can ask them about that. How did you find doing the course or whatever it was? Or hated it, absolutely hated it. Okay, well, that's probably not a good sign. But if they go, I love learning, I like learning new things, well, then this is the right job for you because you're going to learn all these new things. Yeah, fantastic. I love it. I love it. Do you suggest more than one, a single in-person interview? I feel that a second interview is only needed if they need to be interviewed by a, a person who's higher on the org chart. Uh, but only if that person is going to be affected by that employee. Like if they're going to be my PA, as an example, then I might get my manager to, to interview them first because I don't want to take the time to do it. But then if the manager goes, yeah, they're good, well, obviously I want to speak to them. But, you know, if we are talking about the practice owner is a dentist, um, and but the, you know they're, they're working, so they don't want to take the time out. Okay, well, get the practice manager just to do the, maybe the first round of interview, and then if they're going to be working close to the practice, the owner, the dentist, then of course that's going to be a second interview. But they can be in the same time frame. Like we can go half an hour with the practice manager, half an hour with the owner. Um, but you've got to tell the person, tell the person in the invite, hey, you're going to meet with the practice manager. Her name's Sarah. And, and you're also going to meet with the owner, if, um, who is this person. And so you can really allow the person to understand the process of the interview. Uh, but I do feel fun. Second interviews are really, from my point of view, you've got the job. We're just going to cross the I's and dot the T's all the way around, I know. But, <laughs> and, and it can be... Sometimes it can be overkill, it can be more, more of a power trip. I, I want to make sure. Well, do you really need to know? You know, you've got, you know, you've got someone else interviewing them. If it's a you know, dental practice, if it's a practice manager, a little bit different, but a nurse, you know, yeah, it's kind of like, do you really need to go over the top? You've already done the video interview, so really you're going to have three interviews. Uh, we've lost candidates because clients have extended their requirements in their interview process, which is fine. But the candidate's gone, I've already got offered another job, so I don't need to do that now. <laughs> and it's interesting, all of these actions are setting an expect or they're setting a scene for that candidate as well. And so they might go, oh, you know, this is all too frustrating. I think working with these people are going to be frustrating as well. <laughs> that's right. And that's what I was saying before about bank details and stuff like that. We have a, a program that I designed that we use to collect that information for our clients. And, and it's simple. It's only a, it's a simple form fill thing that we send to them that go, you ask for their name, their date of birth, you ask for their next of kin, because it shows you care. Like, what happens if I injure myself at work and oh, who do I call? <laughs> but practice managers know how to call. Asks for their super details, asks for their bank details, and any other documentation they've got to provide. And it's just, a, yes, it takes time to create it. It might take you one or two days to be able to create that. But once you've done it, it's there forever. You send them a link and the candidate goes, oh, I've not even started yet, and now they've got all my information, so I know I'm going to get paid. Tell them when the payday is as well. Don't, don't just let them go, is it today or is it tomorrow? Or don't, 
let the other nurse tell them. You want to be telling them before they start. That's it. And as you were mentioning before as well, you know, you're asking them you need to be trained by this particular date or you need to be on top of your responsibilities by this particular date. And so if you're making assurances to them, put a date on it because you you could state this is our culture here, this is our level of professionalism here, but that's all words. They're going to be looking at your behaviour as evidence to back that up. And if you are asking of a certain, a certain standard to them but you're falling down in that, you're really subconsciously telling them this is really i'm saying this is the way we work here but it's kind of not that's right yeah uh, you know everyone looks to the business owner for the for the guidance especially if they're on site all the time like a dentist a business owner normally is they're normally a dental person within that practice or they might have several practices they're going to look at you and go okay well i'm going to do whatever you do and so that's why the buddy system works so well is because if you know, I'm, I could be a great dentist, but a terrible nurse. And I might not, I might go, okay, well, don't follow me. Don't, don't do what I do, because I'm really, and be honest about it. I'm a great dentist, but I, I, I can't do what you do. Um, and that's why I'm going to let this person, who is the best nurse we have, they're going to show you how to do that. So that person's direction of vision is not looking at the business owner going, okay, that's what I've got to do. They're looking at, you've already been told, this is the person. This is the person you've mm. got to follow. And don't, don't look at me, don't bother, because, because I'm crap at that. I'm really bad. And, and you can be honest about things, and you've got to be human at the end of the day. There's nothing worse than looking at the business owner and going, and I've learned this so much within business over the last year, that you look at the business owner, you look at the business owner and be scared. I can't say hello to him or her because they're the business owner. They love it. There's no, they're lonely. They're the loneliest people. <laughs> no one's and no one, to me. No one talks to them because they're scared of them. You're, oh, my God. I, so I used to go up to like, my old bosses and go, hi, mate, how are you doing? And like, the other team, the people in the team will go, you can't call him mate. And I go, why not? <laughs> <laughs> it's not the queen. It's friendly. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a guy who's got a job. Yes, his job is running the business, but you know he's just a person. And you know you build that relationship up, and you just yeah. You know, I think open and honest, and being upfront, and saying you know I, I hate being a dental nurse. I hated being a dental nurse, and that's the reason why I'm not going to show you how to do it. <laughs> I'm going to get someone who's better than me at being a dental nurse to do it. <laughs> <laughs> So that induction process it has, you know, maybe a responsibility of the bookkeeper to get all of the superannuation banking details, uh, next of kin details from the person. It requires the owner to be talking about this is the history of the practice, this is the vision of the practice, this is what makes us all feel excited about caring for our patients, and also setting them up with that buddy person who's going to just teach them the nuts and bolts of their everyday operations while they're working in the practice. Yeah, and there's so many tools out there. Like as you as you're talking about those those points, I, I, these ideas just come into my head. And you know, it's, it's it's as simple as the practice owner creating a presentation to a new employee and doing it on something like Loom, where they can record it and they can see their face. And they're just going to go through. Okay, you know, this we start. I talk about yourself first. I used to be a de- I used to be a dental nurse, and then I then became a, I went to university. I became a dentist. You know, showing someone your history will allow them to understand that they've been there and done it. There's nothing worse than being a business owner or, or even a manager and, and someone else going, oh, if you're not doing it, I'm not doing it. Well, they don't know that you didn't do it or that you have done it. So by going through this process of going, hey, yes, I'm the business owner now, but I was a trainee dental nurse like yourself. Now, this is, I work for these different companies. I work for 10 different companies before I started my own, my own business. Uh, we this is the location where we started. You know, talk about the history of the business. Talk about the rest of the team. Put pictures of them of the, on the screen. And, and induction doesn't have to be, you know, you spend millions and millions of dollars on it. It can just, you know, you can have a budget of five hundred dollars, and that thing will be there forever. All you've got to do is change the presentation or change the, what it's about. And it's simple to do. And having key parts into there, you know, you know who to speak to if you've got an issue. Uh, yes, it might be your buddy. It might not be an issue. And uh, you know, what to do when you're sick. You know, there are times where people start a new job. They've left their job on the Friday. They're meant to start on the Monday, but they're sick. And as a business owner, we go, oh, my God, they're not even turned up on their first day. But people are allowed to be sick. But who do they call on that day? They don't even know at that point because not even walked into the office. So even putting in the, the meet the team into that induction on a set day, uh, there's all these things you can put into it that make the person feel at home before they've even walked into your practice. And um, we want to be able to move them down the path quicker 
You know, we don't want them to take a week to get used to the practice, so let's bring them in a bit earlier, show them around with no one in it, and they've got our full attention. You can even do, just get on your phone and do a video around the practice if you wanted to. Oh, this is surgery one, this is our favourite chair, this is where our instruments go, set it up, and you can actually just create a video, training video, around the practice, so they can see, uh, and you can even just do the instruments with a recording, this is a scaler, this is this, so the person has got it all the time. So. If, you are going to get those people who want to learn about it and they're going to go home and going to go and they are going to watch those videos but if you don't have them they're never going to watch them and these things take half an hour and it's meant to be something that you're good at if you're the business owner so why not talk about it and, and create this content that you can provide on a consistent basis to all the new employees that you get yeah it really is the amount of effort you put in at the start it just pays off in spades for the weeks months and years thereafter and i often say to people who are onboarding somebody new just think about if you were a foster child going into a brand new family environment and you use a great term you want them to feel at home as quickly as possible and if you were a foster child coming into a new home you have no idea how they behave are you allowed to swear under that roof if i feel snackish can I go to the cupboard and grab something to eat or am I going to be told off for that if I am going to be late home for dinner do I need to ring or is it okay that I turn up late home for dinner is there a certain order of people that use the shower in the morning and so recognize the amount of information that this person doesn't know and the more information you can give them will help them feel at home straight you know, far more quickly yeah exactly imagine if that person just turned up and on the on the on the Monday and they had to learn all of this just as it happened. So let's just say the bins go out every Monday, but you came on Monday, the bins already been out. So you're not going to know until two weeks <laughs> that the, the bins are going to go out because you, you're not there in that situation. So how many other things happen through that process? Like, you know, if you've got something in your systems and processes that happens once a month, then it's really hard to keep traction on that and keep doing that because you're only doing it once a month. But if we are providing this information to them, in the first week, yes, it's a lot to bring in. Yes, it's, you know, it's, but that's good. Like, you know, people want that. People don't want to sit down and do nothing. They want, they want to learn. They want to be productive. And by providing all that key information in the document, that's why the biggest companies have amazing, you know, policies on boarding documentation that teach you everything that they do. They tell you everything about that business. They talk about their profit. They talk about their loss. They talk about what they did last year, two, three years ago, because all these people are part of the team to. And you want to be open and honest about that. And um, it's a great analogy that you make about the foster care. And, and that's exactly what it's like. Because we understand, it's the same when I talk about recruitment. I go, I know about it, so I just talk about it. But someone who doesn't know about recruitment will find it so interesting and appealing. But if I've got a new employee, I think, oh, yeah, they're going to know it because I know it. Well, that's, you know, it doesn't work, doesn't work like that. You've got to break it down for them. You've got to you know, lead them down that garden path to, the, to be able to do what you want them to do. And the more information you provide to them, uh, the quicker they're going to go down that path because they're going to learn it quicker rather than go, oh, six months down the line. Oh, no one told me that. <laughs> like six months down the line, no one told me that that's the way it had to, had to go. So, you know, and dentals... A pretty easy way to do it you've already got your you know your manuals and stuff like this you've, they're already there and so it's just really putting your spin onto that and, and your personality onto that and um it will last you forever and ever and if you start to grow and you have more practices then you've already got a real good baseline of it and you've just got to add a few things in and then all of a sudden you've got a great induction program and training documents and uh, it can last you forever yeah, wonderful. And just maintain that, that open communication and make sure that that new employee can come to you and with questions. Oh, I've, I think I've stepped up with this one. Like, can you train me in that process again? I'm feeling a bit unsure. I'm feeling a bit overwhelmed. I need a bit more experience with this particular thing. Just maintain a safe space for them to communicate exactly what they're going through. Then you can support them through it properly. Yeah, and, and even go as far as having set dates in your calendar already booked in to have a catch up with every person, not just the new people. The new person, you know, you're obviously going to meet them on the first day. I'd be definitely having a catch up two, two or three times in that week. How are you getting on? What's going on? You know, how, how are you feeling, etc. And then slowly, gradually just break that off. Um, but um, And I think a lot of business owners are not going to like what I say now, <laughs> um, but we've it's really what we're going to do is we're going to have several other interviews through through the year again but it's a two-way conversation like like 
be brave as a business owner. We don't like asking this question because we think we know it all and we think we're perfect. How am I doing with you? You know, what is there anything you need from me? Is there anything that I could do better with you? And you know, they're going to be honest. And hopefully, they're going to be honest with you. But you've got to build that relationship up for, to allow them to speak to you about it. So having this, uh, I'm the boss and you're the employee. That's why it doesn't work because employees go, oh yeah, you're a great boss, and then go and speak to Sarah and go, hey Sarah, I like it. It's terrible. <laughs> like I'd rather you know, we want to we want to know why we're terrible. Oh, you're terrible because you say you're going to do something, you don't do it. Okay. I can improve on that. I'm going to improve on that. I know that my team are saying that. Like, as I turn around to her and say, you're really bad at suction. Like, well, okay, well, how do we fix that? We both have to train, but we do it in a constructive way because we both want to improve. And there's so much comes from those conversations. And if you have them regularly enough, probably once a month is probably too long, maybe once every couple of weeks. Could be 10, 15 minutes in the calendar. Hey, how are you getting on? How are you feeling? Oh, you know, don't feel so great. I've got issues at home, whatever. Okay, I'm not saying you can have time off, but at least I understand why your work rate has lowered. And that person then will be re- relieved because they're going to go, oh my God, I was so worried about work. Now I can just come in and do what I've got to do and do the best I can, and I can deal with the home life, and, the, and everyone knows about it, and, and the boss knows about it. So good things can come from these conversations, and also bad, bad things come from it. I don't like you as a boss. I don't like you anymore. Okay, well, how do you move forward from this? You know, do you want me to support you in finding a new role? You know, and, and don't take it personally and be aggressive about it. At the end of the day, everyone's going to move on at some point. And um, if somebody's not liking it there, it's better to support them and move them on quickly, but legally, <laughs> uh, than to have them around and them going, you know, being the, the poison within it because it spreads really quickly. And then all of a sudden you get the new employee comes in and there's bad vibes. You know, it's, you, you don't want that. So, But you've got to be brave. You don't want it. Yeah. Be brave. Ask that question. Yes, it's going to be confronting to you sometimes, but don't we all want to improve and learn? Then. And this is the thing you ask any ask any employer, do you want your employees to be consistently getting better? The answer is always going to be yes. And so you need to exhibit that, model that behavior for them to be able to pick up on that and, and follow suit. And early when I owned my practice, I knew I was not going to be an automatically great leader of people so and I, and I really wanted to be good at it and I would ask that question it was very uncomfortable at the start what can I do better for you how am I falling down in your eyes it can be very uncomfortable receiving that feedback at the start but let me tell you it only takes two or three experiences of it and all of a sudden you start seeing the benefit of it and the benefit so far outweighs any discomfort the discomfort just kind of falls to the side and now I'm you know very happy to receive any kind of feedback but it is a magnificent culture to develop in your team that we're all trying to get better every one of us are trying to get better and it, to get better we just need to have that feedback that's it and, and that could be the hardest part we see it in recruitment a lot you know someone goes for an interview they don't get the job. The feedback is very generic because people are scared of giving the feedback. And um, I think we've got to be more open and honest about you know, how we how we work and, and what we want from our business. And um, the more you include your family, because we all, everyone, so many people call it, you see the job ads, oh, come and join our family, come and join our family. All right, well, are you telling them all the problems? You know, your problem as a business owner, you, you might speak to someone and they go, oh, yeah, but have you tried to work wherever it could be? And having those conversations and being open about your business, you know, obviously, if you're really, you know, really struggling and your cash flow is really bad, it, it, might, it might still be a great idea to discuss that because they're still your team. If you're there, your family, you know, I've, I've had issues with, with my businesses and I've spoken to my family about it. So why not these people in your team? They're, they're, yes, some of them might go on running away and going to hide and go and get a new job. Well, that's not the person who's going to support you in building your business, is it? So good things and bad things come from feedback, but you can always turn them into positive actions and improve not only just yourself, but obviously your business. Beautiful. I love it. So you are available to help any dental practices out there in their recruitment process. What's the best next step if people do want to reach out to you because they're struggling with the challenge of recruiting at the state at this moment? Yeah, and it's, it's interesting at the times at the moment. People are you know, saying there's a candidate shortage. We've got this big resignation that's going to happen apparently next year. Um, the biggest thing is you've got to be consistent. 
and 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 the, we all know that in a dental practice people can be time poor we've got you know patients to see etc so it can be very hard to be consistent and that's what we make sure we do for you so if anybody wants to learn more about simplified recruitment solutions then they can either reach out to my email address uh, which is bobby at simplified recruitment.com.au um, or they can get in touch with julie and julie can pass me the details on and um you know if it's if they want to use a service, then great. Or they want some advice. I'm here to help you guys because I know how hard it can be. So um, just please, if you want support, reach out and I can help you out. I love it. Thank you so much. It's going to be an enormous benefit to anyone to just to broaden their perspective out and learn from someone that does it for a job and has been doing it for many, many years. What are the tips and how can we make this system work for us much more effectively? So thank you so much for your time today, Bobby. I really do appreciate it. No worries. Thanks for your time as well. I appreciate it. And all of the links to Bobby's website and contact details are in the show notes. So if you're interested, please do jump onto those. But until next time, I hope you have a fantastic week. See you later. Hey, if you enjoyed listening to this episode, you should join the club. The club members receive an online lunch and learn every week where I share insights, systems, and strategies to improve the success of your practice. These lunch and learns could not be easier. They are recording so you can watch them at a time that suit you. Members also have full access to the library of all of our past topics. It is a powerful and effective way to upskill your team. I hope to see you there.